We have announcements first. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, call the meeting to order. And I just want to start by uh, wishing you all many blessings in the new year ahead, in addition to welcome, welcoming you to the Scottish American History Forum. I believe we have a few uh, new faces on today. Uh, and I think most of you, though, know that the Scottish American History Forum is part of the Arts and Cultural Division of Chicago Scots, formerly the Illinois St. Andrews Society, which founded the oldest 501c3 charity in the state of Illinois in 1845, which oh. was later named Caledonia Senior Living and Memory Care, located in North Riverside. And um, by the way, I'm afraid I have come down with a wee cold, and so I do apologize for my voice. Chicago Scots is dedicated to nurturing Scottish identity through service, fellowship, and celebration of Scottish culture, in addition to support of Caledonia Senior Living and Memory Care. So for additional information, please go out and check our website, which can be found at www.chicagoscots.org. And we'll ask everyone to please give generously to our Caledonia Senior Care Charity. It's a one of a kind mission that all Scots can be proud of. Now, before we begin our presentation today, uh, Jack, is Gus going to be joining us? I think I heard back from him this morning. But Jack, if you'll let, let me know if, if uh, um, Gus joins. Typically our president joins and, and greets everyone and says a few words, but I don't see him on quite yet this morning. I have one more small announcement before we begin the presentation today. And that's regarding our presenter next month on Saturday, February 10th. We will be hosting historian and author David O. Stewart, and he'll be speaking to us on The Burning Land, One Family's Passage Through the Civil War into the West. So I do hope you'll all be able to join us for this discussion with the author of George Washington, The Summer of 1787, Impeached, Madison's Gift, and other important texts. And I don't believe I see Gus or Dawn. Um, Jack, do you have any updates from Caledonia for us today? Yes, you thank you, Connie. Um, oh, beautiful. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we have uh, two separate uh, burn suppers that are going to be happening um, in the next couple of weeks. Happy New Year to everyone as well. Uh, our first one will be at Martyrs Live in Chicago, if you can make it. That'll be January 25th from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. We're going to have music and poetry and whiskey tasting, um, and it'll be a great time. So I hope to see everybody there. There's a complimentary ticket. Um, you'll show up and I'll be there. Um, Martyrs Live. That's uh, on Lincoln Avenue. And then... Um, we also have uh, Nick with Burns, run by our very own Nancy Strolley um, of the board. That will be uh, January 27th, uh, and that'll be at the Grand Ballroom of the Oak Lawn Hotel. Uh, to get tickets to that, you got to email nickwithburns at gmail.com. Um, you can go to Chicago uh, Scott's slash events as well to, to get that email and look at the full invitation. Um, but that will be, as I said, January 27th. Uh, at the Hilton Oak Lawn. Excellent. Well, thank you. I hope everyone will be able to, to attend that live within the Chicago area. Um, I'm going to minimize my comments, but I just think it, we'll go ahead and start the presentation today. We are absolutely delighted to have Dr. Bruce Allardyce back by popular demand. Um, and Bruce is a professor of history at South Suburban College, and he's going to discuss with us Mary, Queen of Scots, what? myths versus realities. So, Bruce, thanks so much for making the time for us today. 
And I believe Jack and I are ready to turn the program over to you now, please. Okay, well, thank you, Connie. Uh, thank you for having me again. Uh, first of all, I'll say I've heard David Stewart speaking. He'll give a very good presentation. Uh, he's a very, very learned fellow, too. I can, I can verify that. Uh, hopefully, my voice will hold out today. I seem to have the same cold that everybody in the Chicago area has. So, Connie, you, you don't know what you're missing. Chicago and the rest of the world. <laughs> Chicago and the rest of the world, exactly. <laughs> Uh, from there we go. Well, my talk today is on Mary, Queen of Scots, myth and reality. Mary Stuart, Queen of Scots, has long been portrayed as one of history's romantically tragic characters. She's been called devious, naive, beautiful, sexually voracious, often highly principled. She secured the Scottish throne and bolstered the position of the Catholic Church in Scotland. Her plotting, including the probable involvement in the murder of one of her husbands, led to her flight from Scotland and imprisonment by her equally ambitious cousin and fellow queen, Elizabeth I of England. You know, when Elizabeth ordered Mary's execution in 1587, it was an act of exasperated frustration rather than political wrath. Unlike many of the films and biographies of Mary this morning, I intend to show Mary as she really was, not as a romantic heroine necessarily, but as the ruler of a European kingdom with far greater economic and political importance than, its, than the size of Scotland or its location would have otherwise indicated. I will also contend that Mary's downfall is not simply because of bad luck in the crisis years of 1565 to 1567, but because of her way of dealing or failing to deal with the problems facing her as a Renaissance monarch. She was tragic because she was born to supreme power, but was incapable of coping with that power's responsibilities. Her extraordinary story has become one of the most colorful and emotionally searing tales of Western history. I said, my talk today will focus on Mary the monarch as much as Mary the person. Oops, I don't get to here. All the way to the top, okay. Interesting. What the heck? Ah, there we go. First of all, I'm going to start out showing you a video in a second. This is a still from one of the earliest movies ever made. This is from 1895. It's going to be a silent movie. It's depicting the execution of Mary Stewart. Now, why filmmakers chose that in 1895, I can't say. And it's going to be an 18-second video. Some people say that this is the world's first horror film. For film historians, it's the first known action of the stop motion splice trick. In other words, they have an actor putting, actually it's a male actor uh, portraying Mary in this. He puts his head on the block and then they stop the thing and then they replace him with a mannequin and then they're gonna chop down and cut off the mannequin's head. So, um, So, geez, get back here. Screen. And as I said, this is going to be silent, so don't expect any sound from it. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Boom. <laughs> yeah, as I said, that's film history for you there. But that, I think, illustrates... Um... Right. Next screen, next slide. 
how often Mary Stewart has been portrayed in movies? These are probably the two you're probably most familiar with. Vanessa Redgrave and Mary Queen of Scots, 1971. And Catherine Hepburn, who was a, Sc a Scottish descent herself in Mary of Scotland in 1936. <laughs> but among the portrayals are that 1895 movie, The Loves of Mary Queen of Scots, silent film 1923, the Hepburn movie from 36, the TV series Rain, Elizabeth I, Mary Queen of Scots in 2018, uh, The Heart of a Queen, which was a German movie of all things, done in 1940. A German movie, Silent, Mary Stewart, 1927. She's been portrayed probably in total more than all the other monarchs of Scotland combined. Now, did she look like Catherine Hepburn? Well, I'll let you judge for yourself. That's her on the left, a contemporary portrait of her on the left. On the right, these are thing, these are modern recreations taken from the alleged death masks of Mary Stewart. And as you can see, the death masks, the recreations are fairly close to what she was looking at during history. Now, the legendary beauty of Mary Stewart has been much vaunted. Whether she was a beauty by modern standards or not, she was certainly rated a beauty by the standards of her own time. When she was 23, a Venetian ambassador wrote of her being a princess who was, quote, personally the most beautiful in Europe. Even John Knox, her most venomous opponent, never inclined to pass compliments to those he disagreed with, admitted her appearance was, quote, pleasing. Her effect on the men around her was certainly that of a beautiful woman. Her future, future, future jailers, George Douglas and later Sir Francis Nellis, were seduced by her charms. Her husband's little brother Charles was so much in love with her that he was said to gaze at her portrait with longing and desire to marry her himself after the untimely death of her first husband. Her most marked physical characteristic was her height. In an age people are shorter than they are today, she stood five foot eleven, towering not over other women, but also most of the men she came in contact with. She was an excellent dancer and a good athlete who could hunt, walk, and be even right at the head of an army in a manner calculated to dazzle the public eye. At a time when the personal appearance of a sovereign was of great importance, she had that personal presence. To these physical attributes, she wedded that essential human ingredient to attraction, charm, the most dangerous and the most desirable of all human qualities. The next two slides are timelines. She's born in 1542. Her father dies six days after she was born. So literally, her entire life, except for the first six days, she was Queen Regnant of Scotland. But of course, being too young, her regency was declared. We'll talk, we'll talk about the regency in a bit. At the age of six, she's sent to France to live with her French relatives, in part because uh, her mother was French, a very high noble woman in France, but also because the English under Henry VIII and his successors we're doing what they call the rough wooing of uh, Scotland to try and get Scottish government to be pro-English and pro-Protestant. So just for her own safety, they sent her out. Well, she lives and ra is raised in France. And in 1858, she married the king of France's young son and heir, who becomes king himself a year later and dies within a year. In 1561, at the age of 19, Mary returns to Scotland to actually start her reign. In 1565, she marries again her first cousin, Lord Darnley. In 1566, her secretary is murdered. In 1567, her second husband is murdered. We'll go into the details on that. And quite soon after, she marries Lord Bothwell. James Hepburn, who everybody believed, and rightly so, to be her husband's murderer. Mary is forced to abdicate, and she's imprisoned. 
1868, she spectacularly escapes prison, tries to regain her throne, but fails, flees to England, and then she's put in prison in England by her cousin, Queen Elizabeth. And in 1587, she's executed for allegedly plotting against Queen Elizabeth. She was of the Stuart dynasty. And this is a picture of some of the monarchs of the Stuart dynasty. They had inherited the throne because uh, Sir Walter Stuart had married uh, the daughter of Robert the Bruce. And when Robert the Bruce's son David died without heirs, uh, his nephew, Robert Stuart, ascended the throne as King Robert II. The Scottish monarchy was considered by most people in Europe to be rather unstable. James the First, James the Second, James the Third, James the Fourth, four monarchs in succession, all died violent deaths. And because they died violent deaths, they usually died young, it was very common in Scotland for regents to be the actual rulers as the monarch, the heir to the throne, would eventually become of age. So in the Stuart dynasty of the 150 years before Mary, Queen of Scots, the actual Stuart's monarchs had not reigned for even half of those years. It was very much a minority rule. And it's hard to establish and govern a monarchy and have monarchical power when that monarch is either absent or too young to govern. Scotland's regencies were, in fact, a political and feuding nightmare, as various relatives and various nobles sought to grab power by grabbing government and literally kidnapping the young kings. James I, for example, he was taken prisoner by the English at age 12, and he spent 10 years in uh, more than 10 years in England as a prisoner there. James II got killed by an exploding cannon. James III died at Sachiburn in a rebellion, sponsored in part by his son James IV, who died fighting the English at the Battle of Flodden in 1513. James V inherits the throne at age one. Again, the uh, first 16 years, it's regencies again. He eventually gets of age and dies of a broken heart after his army gets routed by the English in 1542. And all this is to set the context for Mary's reign. The Scottish monarchy that Mary inherited was not like the monarchies of England and France and other much more powerful European powers. But it did have resemblance. As historian Jenny Wormald points out, quote, Scotland was a state which never burdened its people by excessive demands for money or men. No early modern king of England or Europe, however wealthy or powerful, had the resources to personally control the localities of his or her kingdom. All the monarchs had to persuade and to rely on the cooperation of those with influence in those localities, almost always a local noble. When, as in Scotland, little is asked by the government, there is little need for strenuous efforts to direct and control local affairs from the center. The direct result was that central government institutions, especially the bureaucratic side of government, were comparatively undeveloped in Scotland, even compared with other European countries. Much more than in other European countries, practical power in Scotland rested with the local nobility. And since the Scottish monarch had limited capability to force those local nobles to take actions against their will, the success or failure of a Scottish monarch rested largely on the personal relationships of that monarch with the nobility. Now, Queen Mary became monarch under especially trying circumstances. In a Scotland riven by the usual family feuds, the three great families of Hamilton, Stuart, and Douglas 
constantly vied for power and constantly vied against each other. <laughs> but in addition, there was a growing religious schism, Catholic versus Protestant. And that schism's political clash between pro-English and pro-French viewpoints. Well, this is James V, Mary's father. He was known as the Red Todd. Uh, he was an active monarch and an active lover of women, not his wife. So while he had only the one daughter who survived him from his marriages, he had a whole bunch of children who were Mary's half-brothers and sisters. On the right is Mary of Guise, Mary's mother. She was a French noblewoman. And if anyone raised her, it was Mary of Guise. Even when Mary, a queen of Scots, was in Scotland, she was getting a half French upbringing. And then when she was moved to France, it was practically an entire French upbringing. Now, Mary of Guise is going to be the regent of Scotland from 1554 to 1558. And if you're not familiar with the term region, I should explain that's basically vice king or substitute for the king or the monarch. Here's the person who was the region of Scotland for most of Mary's youth, James Hamilton, the Earl of Moran. A rather unfortunate choice, but he was chosen because he was the next in line to the Scottish throne. He was a distant cousin, and if Mary dies, He's going to be King of Scotland. Unfortunately, he for Scotland, he was a weak man whose character was ever ir irresolute and therefore repeatedly treacherous as respected his alliances and friendships. He vacillated between amiable sentimentality and spasmodic ferocity. Although not a man of any capacity and quite unpracticed in military or naval service, his royal connections and feudal power seem to have given from the first a disproportionate share in public commands. At first pro-English and Protestant, he converted to Catholicism when he became regent and supported a pro-French policy. He was made a, Scot a French duke, the Duke of Chateau-Laurent. And then during the Scottish, later in the Scottish Reformation, he became a Protestant again to oppose the regency of Mary of Guise, who was Catholic. Mary of Guise described him as, quote, the most inconstant man in the world. Now his ultimate goal was to marry his eldest son, who was about Mary's age, to Mary, so that the, their claims to the throne would merge and there'd be a Hamilton dynasty ruling Scotland. Unfortunately, Ham, uh, Aran's wife was having mental issues and it turned out that his son was um, basically put in an insane asylum. So the grander plans of Iran never came about. Queen Mary. Her father, James V, on his bed, deathbed said it came with a lass and it will go with a lass. And what he meant was that the Stuarts inherited the throne because of marrying a lass, a daughter of Robert the Bruce. And he said they'd lose the throne with Mary, Queen of Scots. She was Catholic in an increasingly Protestant country, a country also politically divided, largely but not entirely along religious lines between those who wanted to maintain Scotland's old alliance with Catholic France and those who wish closer alliance with increasingly Protestant England. Historian Jenny Wormo labels Queen Mary the reluctant ruler. After her mother Mary of Guise died in 1560, Mary of Scotland was called back from Scotland to rule, but she chose to linger in France for a year. She preferred France to England, actually. France to Scotland, I should say. Her absence created a vacuum in the central government for 14 months. Now, the Protestant rebels of 1559-60 and 1560, who had forced Mary of Guise from the Regency, 
they'd set themselves up as a grand council of the realm to control the affairs of the realm. And since Mary didn't come back, they ruled Scotland for a year. It can hardly be overemphasized how unusual that was to have um, a completely absent monarch and a largely hostile grand council essentially ruling the monarch's country. In those days, even inept monarchs attempted to exercise control. Their problems arise from the ineffectiveness with which they did it. In Mary's case, we have the unique spectacle of a monarch who, for the first 14 months of her reign, actual reign, made no attempt to impose a rule or even visit her country. In her defense, we can note her personal feelings. She was comfortable in France, a resident of the most brilliant and wealthy court in Europe. She was brought up in France, not Scotland. Her devotion to France was such that in 1558, at age 16, she signed a secret treaty with France, whereby should she die without children, the King of France, and not the next Scottish heir, would inherit Scotland's throne. When in 1560 she was summoned to return to France and actually rule, she was only 18 years old, remember, and perhaps intimidated at the prospect. When she did return, though, she did little to actually govern Scotland. Again, some more context. Scotland had at this time an elected parliament, chosen on roughly the same basis as that of England. But most of the week-to-week -week work of the Scottish government was carried out by the royal council, not the parliament. That body was in theory chosen by the monarch, but in practice the greater nobles, the Hamilton Earls of Moran, the Stuarts Earl of Lax, the Douglases, Earls of Morton and Angus, they were too important to be left off, so they dominated. And the remainder of the council consisted of a few state office holders, such as the chancellor, the chief legal officer, and the treasurer. It was through this council that a monarch could, if the monarch chose, exercise control of the government of the nation. And it's not that Mary chose her council badly. The heavily aristocratic nature of the council membership could hardly be avoided. What is puzzling is she made hardly any choices at all. And when she did, she often chose her Protestant enemies. When the council met, Mary made little or no effort to even attend the meetings. Now contrast her rule with that of her son, James VI. In 1596, for example, James attended 37 of the 47 royal council meetings. But in 1564, Queen Mary attended only five of the 50 meetings. In the crucial year of 18, 1566, she attended only 12 out of 62. She <laughs> made little effort to attend and little effort to reshape the council membership to reflect her views. Mary lived to age 45 and she reigned in theory for 25 years. But in practice, she only even attempted to rule for six of those 25 years. Now, power usually has a void. Who filled it? Her half-brother, quite often, James, the Earl of Moray. Her elder half-brother, illegitimate son of James V, who was a Protestant. If you remember the 1971 movie, the great actor Patrick McGowan plays uh, Moray. And he uses this quote, just, I was born on the wrong side of, bed, of the bed, sister. I can't reign and don't want to reign, dear sister. I just wish to rule. He and his fellow Protestants wanted the power. They didn't necessarily want to depose Mary. All our husbands. This is husband number one, Francis II of France on the left there. He was a year younger than Mary and quite sickly. He inherited the throne of France a year after their marriage and died the next year at age seven, at age 18. The two had grown up together in, in France and were quite fond of each other. But most believe that Francis was too sickly to ever sire a child or indeed survive adulthood. And these people were proven right. Mary certainly couldn't choose it. 
This is her, her with her second husband, Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley. Now, Darnley was the son of the Earl of Lennox and thus of the high nobility. He had been raised in England as much as he had in Scotland. He had a very good claim to the English throne, second, in fact, only to Mary's, if Queen Elizabeth dies. Now, Darnley is a Catholic, but not a very devout one. What did Mary see in him? Well, he was tall. He was very good looking. He was a stud muffin. Mary was originally clearly infatuated with him and married him against everyone's advice. Now, Darnley was one of the few characters in history that I've run across where nobody seems to have thought well of him. Not even his fa own father. He was vain. He wasn't very bright. He was inconsistent. He was alcoholic. He was unfaithful to his wife. He wished to be not just king consort of Mary, but king in fact, King Henry I of Scotland. And of course, he faced personal problems because he was a Scottish noble. And the other nobles of Scotland didn't want one of theirs, one of a rival family, elevated to the kingship. <clears throat> this is a portrait of husband number three, James Hepburn, the Earl of Bothwell. Now, unlike the Darnley, this guy is all man and all soldier. He was a bold, fierce border layer and a Protestant. As we'll see later, he had arranged for the murder of Lord Darnley, her second husband. He was not alone. He was uh, basically heading up what every lord in Scotland wanted to do. The marriage was a rough wooing. Arguably, he kidnapped Mary, though you know, some people say it was with Mary's consent. Arguably raped her, married her, and then tried to proclaim himself king. He met with almost unanimous opposition. Basically, not for his person, but because he was widely believed to be uh, her second husband's murderer. Uh, Hepburn is forced to flee Scotland. He takes refuge with his relatives in Norway. He's imprisoned by the King of Norway and goes insane. What was Mary's uh, relation with him? Well, we don't know for sure. She probably acquiesced in the so-called kidnapping. And she was certainly willing to grant him political power, which he wanted. But she was probably also unhappy with being forced to marry her. Yeah. Well, if Mary doesn't have enough trouble with the nobility, here's the real thorn in her side. John Knox, the great preacher. And you can see just from this picture, just you can see he's a pretty forceful, formidable guy. Now, John Knox was a handful brilliant Protestant preacher, an utterly fearless exponent of what he considered to be religious truth, a man who'd tell anyone to their face that they had erred, even the queen, fanatic Calvinist, and he preached Calvinism right next to the royal palace. He had no respect for anybody's authority, not the queen's, not even his own fellow Protestant lairds. Scotland is in the midst of a reformation. And while in 1560, the Parliament of Scotland declared Scotland to be officially Protestant, there's still a very sizable number of Catholics in Scotland. Now, Mary, to the extent that she had any policy, tried to pacify her Protestant majority and the Protestant majority on the council and really just resolve, just reserve private Catholic worship for herself and her few companions. But this private Catholic worship was denounced by John Knox, who also invaded against women ruling a country. He was very misogynist, if you use today's context here. The mid-1500s were, were a challenging time for rulers of every European country because of this Protestant Reformation. Religious solidarity created a new nexus of authority one separated from the traditional national, feudal, and family bonds. In other words, where as a ruler before this Reformation could call for obedience and, a, and 
based based on the fact that he or she had feudal or political authority. Now, increasingly, people were looking to see that religious authority was superior to the political. Rulers out of step with the, the nation's religion all had trouble ruling. I'll give you the example of Henry IV of France. He was a Protestant, inherited the throne of Catholic France, and he's converted to Protestantism in order to disarm the opposition, cynically proclaiming, quote, Paris is worth a mass. Mary was not the only monarch in Europe to lose her throne, in part because of religious division. For example, Sigismund of Sweden. He was the Catholic monarch deposed by the Swedes in 1599 by his Protestant uncle and an increasingly Protestant Sweden. Mary's own descendant, James II of England and Scotland, a Catholic, he was deposed in 1688, 120 years after Mary, in favor of his Protestant daughter and son-in-law. In short, Mary's facing a situation that would tax the abilities of a lot of people. And she shouldn't, didn't measure up to it at her young age, probably shouldn't be that surprising. <coughs> Mary might not have spent a lot of time um, at the Royal Council, but she spent her days in enjoyment. Was she the first woman golfer? Well, we don't know. But she was the first one who history records. And because she was French, she had a young page carry her clubs around. A young page in France was known as a cadet. And the Scots uh, mismangled the word into the word caddy, and that's where the word caddy comes from today. She played at St. Andrew's Golf. She was a noted tennis player, a hunter, an archer. She had archery butts erected in the south gardens of her Hollywood Hollywood Palace to allow her to practice. And she hunted deer in Hollywood Root Park. There was also a sheep, flock of sheep in the park who were managed for the queen by a keeper. She traveled. This is a picture I took uh, when I was at St. Andrew's College, near the golf course there. And this is a picture of a tree that was allegedly planted by Queen Mary during her visit there. Well, I'm gonna get off here and uh, uh, transfer to uh, something at least. Um, To, uh, I got another video to show you here, so hold on a second while I try and get to that video. Uh, and I got to get out of that. There we go. On the 9th of March, 15th. Get back to the Zoom here and uh, start sharing this one here. This is a video on the murder of David Riccio. Riccio had been in France with her. She came, he came over with her. He was Catholic. He was a, a entertainer. He was her personal secretary. And um, unfortunately, he got the uh, he engendered the ire of a lot of people. 1966, Mary Queen of Scots was dining in this small room next to me with some of her companions, including her Italian secretary, David Rizzio, one of her favourites. There were rumours going around that Mary and David might be having an affair. The Queen had fallen out with her husband, Darnley, and Mary was several months pregnant with their child. Darnley came into the small chamber, put his arm around his wife, and that was the signal for conspirators to burst upon the scene. They took control of the palace here, they grabbed David Rizzio, and they dragged him through to the next room. Follow me to find out what happened. Once David Rizzio was brought through to this room, he was stabbed 56 times. We know this because Mary writes this in her own accounts later on. And he was basically dragged through this spot, stabbed 56 times, and left to die. 
and visitors to the Palace of Holyrood House today can still see the spot where we believe he died. Wow. I don't know if I got the sound quite right there, but uh, you get the idea. Huh? Yes, her husband and the highest Scottish nobles conspired to murder her secretary right in front of her. Extraordinary. Um, Darnley was probably motivated by the idea that she was having an affair with Rizzio. There's no evidence of that, of course. Um, others uh, just didn't like a Catholic being involved with uh, Mary. Some rumors say that they, they did it in front of her deliberately so that she would miscarry her child not have a child and therefore uh, other people could inherit the throne. This is the room where it happened. Uh, again, you can see there's a blood stain on the floor. You can see the uh, plaque there marking it March 9th, 1566. Now, the conspirators had deliberately involved Darnley in the murder. In fact, they used Darnley's own knife to stab Rizzio, to make sure that he'd be implicated. And why did they want Darnley implicated? Because they figured that was a get-out-of-jail card free. The queen couldn't go after the murderers because if she did, she'd have to go after her own husband. Mary, of course, wanted to punish the murderers. So what she did was she somehow got Darnley back on her side and got him to renounce the murderers. And that got and that rid them of the rid the murderers of uh, their get out of jail free card. The murderers included, you know, the Earls of Morton and uh, Lord Lindsay and uh, many of her council members. In fact, she raises an army and chases these uh, murderers out of Scotland, the so-called chase about raid. Um, they hide in England. They're mostly Protestant. They hide in England and wait for a chance to get back. Mary forgives Darnley at least briefly, but she can never quite trust him again. And that's where the Kirk of Fields tragedy comes. And this is going to be, Mark, the downfall of her reign. And again, I'm going to have to uh, get out of here somehow. And um, This is the famous or infamous Kirk of Fields murders. Her husband, Lord Darnley, is going to be assassinated. Not much sound on this to begin with. This is showing the modern side of it. It's right in downtown Edinburgh, not too far away from the Royal Palace. I drink a toast to my firstborn. Played here by Timothy Dahl, who later played the James Bond. Planes for its seal in that movie.
jumped out of the windows to save me. The Kirk of, this is an illust, contemporary illustration of the Kirk of Fields murders. Darnley's body was found in a nightshirt in the yard outside. He'd been strangled by people. He wasn't injured by the explosion at all. The Kirk of Fields murder, the Darnley murder, is one of the great historical mysteries of all time. Now, there's little or no doubt who physically did it. The investigation quickly showed that uh, the Earl of Bothwell's uh, Hepburn minions, I guess you'd say, and the Earl of Morton's Douglas minions uh, carried out the actual murder. Nor is there a lot of doubt why it was done. Bothwell and Morton and basically everybody else in Scotland wanted revenge for Darnley for betraying them after the Rizzio murder. Seemingly, everybody in Scotland except Darnley's own father had a reason to want him dead. But this is only half the story. Why use gunpowder, which would spectacularly blow up and wake everybody up? Obviously, you want to get away with something. You don't want to make it that public. And which the transfer of the kegs of powder into that house could give the murderer more away, which it did. The transfer might have and arguably did wake Darnley up, necessitating him being strangled later on. Probably the more important thing questions in this are Mary's involvement. Was Mary one of the intended victims? Some people say yes. She had actually been in the house visiting her husband earlier that evening, then went back to Hollywood Palace for a wedding reception for one of her friends. Some people say that the plot was to blow both of them up. Conversely, did she know about the attempted murder and refused to stop it? Again, she had no more love for Darnley than anybody else did. Did she have guilty knowledge of the murder? Well, many people in Scotland believe so. What's the real cause of her downfall was not her lack of governance, was her alliance and marriage with Bothwell, suspected of murdering her husband. Yeah, they tried to do a prosecution of Bothwell, and Bothwell came with 800 of his soldiers, and nobody dared to accuse him of anything in public, so he was exonerated in that sense. As I mentioned before, he so-called kidnapped her, married her. And in the public minds, that implicated Mary in her husband's murder. Remember, she already had trouble being a Catholic in a Protestant nation and that, and now she's accused of murdering her husband. Well, Bothwell wants to be king and basically rule under Mary. Uh, he raises an army. The rebels raise an army. They meet at the Carberry Hill outside of Edinburgh. And basically, Bothwell's army deserts him. Again, this was very common in those days. They really didn't have a reason to fight for a murderer. His army collapsed. Mary is taken prisoner by the rebels. And as I said before, he flee Bothwell flees Scotland. Mary abdicates her throne. Now, is this voluntary? Not really, of course. 
it was under pressure. They were saying, you're going to be tried for your husband's murder unless you voluntarily give up the throne to your now young son, who's going to be James VI of Scotland. And she's imprisoned at Loch Leven Castle, uh, north of Edinburgh. There's a Douglas family stronghold, a castle in the middle of a lake, ruled by the Earl of Morton, who was her sworn enemy. But the rebels are not content to just have her abdicate. They want to blacken her name. And here's where the so-called casket letters come in. These are alleged letters from Mary, written by Mary to Bothwell, to make it look like she was his lover before the murder, and that she, at the, at the minimum, acquiesced in her husband's murder by Bothwell. It was used by the rebels to implicate Mary in the murder and to blacken her reputation and to cut down her support. Now, the original letters have been lost. The casket is still in existence, but the original letters have been lost. All we have today are transcripts and copies. And there's been a big debate whether these were forgeries or not, or whether they uh, the rebels interspersed true letters of Mary's with forgeries that would make her look like she was their husband's murderer. Well, the uh, rebels established their own council and regency. Maury and Morton basically dominated. But increasingly, people may not have wanted Queen Mary, but they certainly didn't want King Morton or King Moray. There's a reaction. She always has her loyalists, by the way. And she makes a spectacular escape from captivity in a, after a year. She got her keeper's younger brother to fall in love with her, and he arranged her spectacular escape. Now, the castle had boats coming, bringing provisions every day from the local countryside, and she disguised herself as one of her ladies and one of the country women, got on the boat, was rowed to shore, and there, by prearrangement, met a few. Lord Seton and a few of her loyalists um, and tried to regain her throne. Now, if you want to know more about this, in a fictional sense, read the Sir Walter Scott's famous novel, The Abbot. She quickly raised a large army of loyalists and others who were disgusted by the rule of Moray and Morton. Many of the soldiers were Hamiltons. And remember, the Hamiltons would inherit the throne if... Uh, uh, Anything happened to Mary and her son. Her army tried to march south of Glasgow to combine with reinforcements coming from the west, but Maury and Morton intercepted them with a smaller but much more professional army. The Battle of Langside was fought in what's now south Glasgow. It was something of a fiasco. The Marians attacked, some of them at least. The Hamiltons sincerely attacked. They sincerely wanted Mary to win. But much of her army held back. Remember, it was an amalgam of Catholics and people who just didn't like Maury and Morton, but didn't especially like the Queen either. Their ostensible commander, the Earl of Argyle, dropped dead of a heart attack when the battle started. Leaderless and confused, the Marians fled. Mary herself mounted a horse and with a few faithful followers fled south to the imagined sanctuary of her cousin's England. <coughs> She spends the rest of her life, and indeed most of her adult life, in prison in England. The regents of Scotland certainly didn't want her back, because they wouldn't be in power anymore. Her son James didn't want to be, see her back when he became of age, because he'd lose his, his power also. And as for Queen Elizabeth, she'd rather keep her rival for the throne in prison than have her loose, out, out on the loose there. Her imprisonment was genteel, wasn't, you know, she lived in a castle for the most part and had servants and good food and everything like that and exercise. She, she had correspondence, but English spies opened all her email. 
her correspondence, her secret correspondence was in code, but Elizabeth's spy name, name source easily broke the code and found out that Mary was at least the focus of various Catholic plots against Elizabeth. Now, these plots were probably exaggerated by Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth's spies were very efficient. They had infiltrated all these groups and knew exactly what was happening. Catholics, yes, they wanted to put a Catholic, in other words, Mary, on the throne of England. So Elizabeth had at least some reason, whether exaggerated or not, to worry if Mary, that Mary might get free. In 1587, Elizabeth tries Mary for the this plotting. And yeah, she had corresponded with rebels. Tried, convicted, and executed. Now, it was unprecedented for one monarch to publicly try and execute another, especially when Mary was her own cousin. But... Queen Elizabeth did that. She was rather ruthless in exercising power, ruthless in a way that Mary, Queen of Scots, wasn't. And that's perhaps why Elizabeth successfully reigned for 45 years, where Mary only survived for six years of reign. Well, what happens to Scotland after the Battle of Langside? Well, there's a bunch of regencies, uh, Morden, Moray, uh, the Earl of Lennox, uh, the Earl of Mar. The royal council ruled until James the Sixth, Mary's son by Darnley, came of age and started a Stuart dynasty where it wasn't S T E W A R T spelling anymore, but S T U A R T, because Darnley, though a cousin, had spelled his name with the French way with the S T U spelling. James the Sixth inherited Mary's claim to the English throne. And in 1603, when Elizabeth dies, James VI goes south and becomes James I of England, too. So again, now without some objection from some of the English, the two countries are united under one king, though they had for the next hundred years separate parliaments and separate governments. Now, James VI was called the wisest fool in Christian. He's a very learned man. He sponsored the King James Bible, the, the great Protestant uh, translation. He was called, he called, considered himself the modern Solomon, hearkening back to uh, the Solomon, the wise Solomon of the Bible. And his descendants rule the combined monarchies even today. The last Stuart dies in 1714. He's succeeded by their German cousin in the House of Hanover. Though there were Stuarts who were around, they were Catholic, and thus they were not allowed to inherit the throne. And of course, that's the, the modern movie with the, the actress Olivia Coleman playing Queen Anne there. This is where Mary spent most of her days, in Hollywood Palace. It was mostly constructed in the 1500s by James IV and V, her grandfather and father. But it's best known for Queen Mary and where Queen Mary spent most of her days, where she granted the famous audiences to John Knox, where she married her second husband, and where her secretary, David Riccio, was murdered. It is still the Queen's official residence when she visits Scotland. When my wife and I visited there about 10 years ago, we were informed about the difference between a royal palace and a royal castle. A royal palace is strictly a place for living. A royal castle has an idea of defense to it too, like a castle, of course, would be. Well, there are, if you want to read more on Mary Queen of Scots, there's uh, more books than I can possibly list. These are the two that I would personally recommend. On my right is Antonia Frazier's bestseller, Mary Queen of Scots. That's more about Mary the person. It's a um, masterly uh, treatment by a public historian. 
and a bestseller. Good read, too, by the way. On the left is Jenny Wormald's more modern, more scholarly work that focuses on Mary's queenship more than her person, though you can't separate the two, of course. And that's uh, that. That's the book that I got a lot of insight for, for um, doing this talk, putting together this talk today. <laughs> well, there's a picture of me and my wife 10 years ago posting Posing in the full regalia there, uh, uh, the backdrop there. Uh, I think it was at a um, knitting a, a Scottish plaid shop shop in Edinburgh, which I can't remember the name of offhand. But um, that's us. That's Scotland, and that's what I'd like to say about Mary Queen of Scots today. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, Bruce, Bruce, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, I'm hoping everyone uh, will now unmute your mics and uh, turn your cameras back on, and we'll have a little question and answer for Bruce, please. Okay, Kai, do you want to take a look at the chat and see if there's any questions for me on chat? I don't want to go back and forth here or anything like that. So, Absolutely. And Jack, maybe you can help me with that as well. I think while we're waiting, uh, Bruce, I happen to have a question for you. Um, you emphasize that Mary lingered in France an additional year rather than returning to Scotland to assume the throne at age 18. And my understanding is that there were significant threats against her life as a child queen which is why she was sent to France for protection, and that similar threats against her life remained at age 18, which is why measures had to be taken to ensure her safe return to Scotland, therefore delaying her return. I'm just wondering if, if you happen to have any information on these threats and the reasons that she was sent to France to be raised uh, and take your refuge as a child. Uh, yeah, I asked this thing. I mentioned a little bit in the talk there that she was sent to France at age six because the English army was rampaging all over the lowlands of Scotland at the time, uh, trying to help the Protestants of Scotland uh, establish their power or at least establish a more pro-English and less pro-Scottish government. Now, you remember England and France had had the Hundred Years' War and they had wars off and on for 100 years after that, literally, also. So they were the old enemies. And France had always had in Scotland an ally that would either invade northern England when England invaded France, or that would furnish thousands of Scottish mercenary soldiers to help the French army defeat the British, the English. So there was that definite tension. That's why she was sent over at age six for her own safety. Now, as far as the return from France goes, the threat here was literally the English Navy uh, and English pirates, because the passageway would have to be by boat from France sailing through the North Sea, which was infested with not just English naval ships, but pro-English pirates and English pirates who would uh, kidnap anybody for a ransom, let alone somebody as uh, good a prize as the king, as the queen of uh, Scotland. So there, the delay was in part because they wanted to take precautions so that she wouldn't be seized on the sea voyage. It wasn't so much an assassination threat as it was a capture at sea threat. And there are some stories that her French flotilla was pursued by pirates and barely made it in and got them ashore, uh, barely evaded the pirates to be able to land Mary in Scotland. Um, so there was there was a very definite threat as to the passage. Plus, of course, uh, any sailing passage in those days carried the threat that your ship would founder. Sailing was incredibly dangerous by modern standards in those days. Any travel was, but especially sailing. You're talking ships that are much, not, not much bigger than your house. Uh, sailing and, uh, you know, the wood would get warped 
leaked and there'd be leaks and uh, the wind might not blow the wind might not blow the right way. They might blow you into England itself, might blow you off course. A hurricane might come and just wreck your ship completely, dismast it. Uh, it was an incredibly dangerous voyage by modern standards. So there was some room for hesitation. But Mary's devotion to France, I think, is more illustrated by the fact that she essentially signed over Scotland to France in that secret 1558 treaty. Now, of course, first of all, she had heirs, so that that provision would never come uh, into being to begin with. But beyond that, uh, she certainly kept it secret because she didn't want her, her royal council to know that she'd essentially signed her country away to France. Thank you. Alfred, do you have your hand up. Do you have a question for Bruce? You'll need to unmute if you do. Well, his hand is no longer up. Questions or comments, please, from the audience. Hey, Connie, um, Bruce, about 10 years ago or so, <clears throat> I saw a Broadway play that was superb. I think it was it began in originated in London, Mary Stewart, uh, and it was based upon the premise <clears throat> that um, uh, in fact uh, Mary and Elizabeth had never actually physically met, and the premise of the play was that they actually did meet, that um, uh, Mary came out of her imprisonment and they had an encounter in the woods. And it was an effort to plead for her life. And the, the play was, uh, the acting was superb. And one of the uh, theatrical devices, which was amazing for me and so memorable, was that they actually created a rainstorm <clears throat> on the stage. And so their encounter was, was uh, more dramatic because of that particular effect. But the acting was superb. So my, my question is, uh, to your knowledge, is that historically true that they had never actually physically met? It is historically true to my knowledge that they never historically met in person. Uh, obviously, they knew all about each other and they had many friends and acquaintances in common and uh, they would have recognized each other instantly, I'm sure. And they were uh, first cousins or second cousins, I think. Uh, but they never actually met. And Mary, I think, would have wanted to have met Elizabeth because I think she thought she would have thought that her charms would have softened uh, Elizabeth's treatment of her. Um, now, whether Mary was justified in thinking of that is probably a little bit wishful thinking because whatever Elizabeth I of England was, she was uh, a practical monarch first and foremost and wouldn't let her emotions. Uh, dictate her policies. Mm -hmm. But he, one of the features of this of this play was the uh, it, it it and this may not be true, but it 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 um, the character of Elizabeth uh, demonstrated such anguish over the decision to have her executed. And so there was there was, was this terrible um, tension uh, the, you know the, the emotional appeal by Mary attempting to Gain her freedom and and, and avoid the uh, avoid death and and this uh, and the 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 uh, conflict internal conflict conflict uh, of Elizabeth not wanting to do it but needing to do it to preserve her her monarchy and I, I would love to see this play resurrected the acting was superb and it was a it was a a, a great experience. Well, I think there wasn't anxiety there if for no other reason because when elizabeth starts endorsing chopping monarchs heads off well she's a monarch too so uh i'm not sure she wanted that precedent to be established in england very much um elizabeth uh, elizabeth's government under lord burley cecil william cecil lord burley and others um sort of were running things uh, with her permission and under her guidance, but they, I think, insisted that, uh, that this execution take place 
and she didn't have enough of a reason to uh, overrule them, though legally she probably could have. Catherine, Catherine, uh, do you have a question? Your hand is up. Uh, not, not a question. Uh, just uh, uh, Bruce, thank you so much for putting the Antonio Fraser book up up there as one of your sources. Uh, I I received that book as part of a book club thing in eighth grade and read it and began a lifelong love of Mary and Tudor English history. And a couple of years later, when I was interviewing to attend a boarding school, I went in for the interview and um, came out several hours later because the, the gentleman who was the admissions director was also a history teacher and he was a Tudor English scholar. And we were we had a two hour long debate about Mary versus Elizabeth. <laughs> so this is thank you for this for this presentation. It's been it's been really great to to review and, and relearn all of this. <laughs> well, the Mary Elizabeth relationship is central to several of the movies, and yes. especially the 1971 movie where uh, I think it's Glenda Jackson playing Queen Elizabeth and she sends her discarded lover uh the earl of leicester played by uh, the good actor daniel massey up and uh her cecil played by trevor howard says you know uh she's you know mary's gonna just fall in love with lester because he's a real man and good looking but mary but in the movie at least mary uh, elizabeth also sends darnley up uh to be sort of uh, lester's rival and she, in the movie, at least, Elizabeth thinks that Darnley is going to be the husband that Mary chooses, and she sort of chuckles to say, boy, I hope she chooses him because she gets stuck with a real loser if she does. Um, you know, there's the, the personal of this political struggle is is fascinating. And, uh, and also the inheritance of the throne. Remember, Mary of Scotland was not the only possible heir to the English throne. There are other more distant cousins, and frankly, there've been Mary's claim was uh, well. There's d debate over who divorced who at the right time, and whether there was a legal divorce and things like that. I want I could spend 50 minutes on the genealogy of the Scottish noble families at the time, but I don't. But literally, there were other candidates that Elizabeth's throne could have gone to, other than Mary and other than James. And so throughout his, throughout both of their lives, there's always the possibility that Elizabeth through some would somehow in, disinherit all the Scottish heirs to the throne and puts, put a more distant English relative on the throne instead. Bruce, uh, uh, something I've always wondered, uh, especially since we McFarlane's were singular part of the Battle of Langside on Moray's side. Why in heaven's name did uh, Mary think that it was a good idea to go down to England and put herself at the mercy of Elizabeth after all of the, con the controversy that already had taken place? Well, that's an excellent question. Uh, why England? Um, I, yeah, you can only speculate, but my speculation would be that Mary had felt like she was so betrayed by so many people in Scotland that Elizabeth was as, as likely to be a friend of hers as anybody in Scotland would be. Uh, there weren't a lot of uh, options. You know, she gets on her horse. She, there's really no place in Scotland she can go to. She probably would want to go to France, if anywhere, but to get there, she has to go through England to get to France. And of course, Elizabeth would make sure that she never got to France in the first place. Um, her life is one of uh, disobedient nobles and betrayals and everything, for the reasons I think I talked about. Um, at that point, I'm not sure she really wanted to rule Scotland anymore. She wanted to preserve She's probably more interested in preserving her English inheritance than anything else. And remember, Eng England had been the refuge for Scots for a hundred years now. 
Hmm. Remember, her opponents had taken refuge in England. Um, it, her husband, Darnley, had been raised in England more than as an exile, more than he was in Scotland. So the connections with, with England were very strong here. And uh, it was not probably the best idea, but it was the least bad idea that she had at the time. You know, Bruce, I, I remember reading something, although I don't know, you know, I don't have the sources with me, but I believe Mary a correspondence, corresponded with Queen Elizabeth and, and that they wrote back and forth. And I thought she had some assurances from Queen Elizabeth and was, was hoping to be redeemed in some way. But I, I'll have to follow up on that. But I, I can remember reading an account to that, you know, to that direction. Well, I think that's an accurate idea that Elizabeth was Elizabeth I was a master of giving vague assurances and promises, but giving her like twenty eight outs and if she wanted to, she was very clever that way and. Uh, all you had it all, all Elizabeth had it to say, oh yeah, you'll have no problem in England and everything like that. But that doesn't mean I'm gonna let you back to, you know, that first of all, that doesn't mean I'm gonna let you back to Scotland. I'm not specifically promising, I'm not just promising an English army to put you back on the throne. And if Elizabeth couldn't within 10 seconds find a Catholic plot in England to put Mary on the throne, she you know, it, it was just child's play for her to find some sort of plot and get and use that as an excuse to keep Mary in close confinement for the rest of her life. Um, monarchs and absolute rulers can always find an excuse to do what they want, and Mary was, and Elizabeth was very much the absolute monarch. Bruce, what did the Spanish, what part did the Spanish play in, in all this? <clears throat> My recollection is that Mary had, there was some accusation that Mary uh, was conspiring with the, uh, the Spanish leading up to the uh, launch of the Armada. <clears throat> well, that, that was part of the whole alleged Catholic plot in the 1580s in England. That's that the Catholics in England were looking to get foreign support. And obviously the, the, the biggest Catholic monarch with the biggest army and navy was King Philip of Spain, Philip II of Spain. So um, there was certainly some correspondence between the Spanish and the English, and, and that was part of the motivation of the Armada, of course. So Spain at this time is very busy with a revolt in what's now the Netherlands, the Low Countries, where the Protestants there want essentially independence from Spain. <laughs> and um, the Catholic monarchs of the Habsburg Catholic monarchs of Spain were so busy and having so much of their resources drained uh, in the Netherlands. Now, the Netherlands were being not so surreptitiously aided in money and troops by Queen Elizabeth of England. So, this was all this Catholic plot was almost a continuation of the Netherlands Low Country War where England was essentially fighting against Spain to begin with. Now, France at this time, though, though Catholic, has its own religious civil wars. And so for better and worse, for better or worse, uh, Mary or the English Protestants cannot depend upon significant French aid for their cause. They have to look to Spain instead. I remember Philip II of Spain had been married to Queen Mary of England. Elizabeth's sister. Now, they didn't have any kids or anything like that, but uh, the connection between Spain's Catholic monarch and the Catholics of England was very strong at this time. And uh, in, a, in an era where people were valuing religious their religious identity more than they were their nationalistic identity or their uh, governmental identity, that connection with, with the greatest Catholic monarch in the world was to many people superior to their nationalist instincts or their Englishness or their loyalty to the crown itself. Um, so there is a there is a uh, definite uh, Catholic presence here. Ironically, when the, the armada got dispersed by the storm, a lot of 
one of the ships sailed north around Scotland to get back to Spain. And several of the ships, including several of the treasure ships, were uh, destroyed and went, went aground on the, on the Scottish coast there. And there's legends of uh, Spanish gold and silver coins to this day being found on the western coast of Scotland by treasure hunters from this armada. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. <laughs> Other thoughts? Oh, Janet, please unmute. That was a clap, not a question. Oh. <laughs> Oh, um, I'm trying to think. Uh, see, Queen Elizabeth, the present Queen Elizabeth is descended from James the Sixth's. Let's see, daughter, grand, yeah, daughter who married the Prince of uh, Bohemia, and went into the German lines and everything, and it, it gets very complicated. Uh, the present uh, King of Scotland, King Charles, has a lot more Scottish blood from his grandmother's side than from the royal side. Uh, the Queen Mother uh, was the daughter of the Earl of Strathern and uh, Kinghorn, uh, was a pure Scot, as pure a Scot as you're going to get. And uh, the Scottish blood of the, the Charles III is more through that line, really, than the royal line itself. Mm. I was just about to do some research on that topic, uh, Bruce, although I haven't done it yet, but I I came across uh, some information on the king that abdicated, uh, David, and uh, he both played the bagpipes and wore, wore a kilt regularly, and so now I'm intrigued about the royal side. I, I want to go back and see exactly what the lineage was. But I think there was some Scots blood there, but I can't speak to it. Yeah, well, one, uh, one of the, I'm just going to say one of the jokes was that uh, Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, was down visiting, I think, in South Africa. And one of the Boers was saying, you know, you realize we, we just hate the English. And her comment was, well, I understand. I'm a Scot. <laughs> Kaching there, yeah, uh, yeah. The uh, well, the royal family. I mean, they, they, it was not till the eighteen hundreds where the, the uh, Hanovers, now the Windsors and Windsor Mountbatten, started to adopt Scotland, Scotland heritage, and that in a big way. Uh, William the Fourth's visit to Edinburgh in eighteen twenty two, and Queen Victoria's vacation at Balmoral, and all the rest. The, the royal family has become more Scottish in um, in its actions as it's become less Scottish in its blood and ancestry. Maybe there's an irony there I don't know about, but uh, uh, you know, uh, oh, and should they old mores? I should maybe just uh, what happened to some of these regions of Scotland? The nobles, more was executed for Darnley's, for Rizzio's murder by a different king, yeah, by a different thing, yeah. He was clearly guilty, of course, but, you know, he, as long as he was in power, he wasn't prosecuted. Moray, the, Mary's half-brother, was assassinated in 1570 by the Hamiltons, just because the Hamiltons hated him and the Stuarts. Um, so most of the people who or I should say many of the people who overthrew Queen Mary themselves met violent ends and unfortunate ends. This is a very tumultuous time. Uh, her son, James VI, was kidnapped at least twice that I can remember by nobles trying to use a, the infant or the young teenage boy to gain power themselves and rule in his name. So this is a this is a tumultuous time, religious-wise, politically, uh, governmentally, and uh, family feud-wise. Every 
you combine the four together, it was very difficult for anybody to be an effective monarch at that time. Bruce, it occurs to me that uh, there may be an irony here. If the Windsors continue to muck up the monarchy, uh, wouldn't it be interesting if uh, Charles had to flee north to Scotland, become the king of Scotland? It's just a, uh -huh. just a humorous aside, which apparently has been lost on everybody. I apologize. Well, I, I'm, I follow the Scottish independence movement pretty closely, and there's some people who say that the Charles III is not King of Scotland at all, uh, legally. I don't agree with it, but I'm just saying that's their attitude. Uh, I think he wouldn't mind being King of Scotland if he wasn't King of the United Kingdom. He certainly looks pretty good in a kilt, and he's yeah. spent a lot more time at Holyrood than most of the Windsor slash Mountbatten monarchs that we've had. Uh, if, they have a mon if they have a monarchy, he you know, I think he'd be a pretty darn good monarch of Scotland, but uh, uh, I don't see him fleeing anytime soon. Let's just put it that way. I don't either. Yeah. Okay, one last comment. Anybody have a, a comment or a question before we adjourn, Deb? Deb? Yeah, yeah, hi, Constance. I'm sorry. So, Bruce, I apologize. It's an off-the-side question, but still a question. Um, are you related to Robert Barkley Allardyce, the great pedestrian? I just have to know. Oh, boy. I've I've actually written on the Allardyce family uh, very extensively. I'm not directly related to the Barkley Allardyces, uh, but they are my clan, you know, as the sept of the clan grand, they are my overlords. And, you know, my family probably came from one of their estates in Kincardenshire. Yeah, mine too, because my my people are from um, Kincardenshire. Well, they're from Strawn and Bankery. And I think that was part of it is like we had this whole, you know, like when you're going through grandma's genealogy research stuff, she, they're like, oh, well, we descend from the Barclays, like and Robert Barclay Elderdice is like the superstar. He's like the Emmett Smith of like the family that you want. And you're looking around and you're trying to kind of reconcile between the records and such. And I'm like, I don't see... The youngest daughter running off with the local stonemason even though that's the story i'm like i don't see it yo like it's just it's not happening they're getting married at a farm they're not getting married you know they're not getting married at a big place but it was interesting because not everybody um not everybody knows about the great pedestrian and and a lot of the other uh people who descend from him in in that area of concordanshire because now it's just all been kind of gobbled up into the administrative district of aberdeenshire which is something anyway, but I just wanted to ask because I don't get to see an elder dice every once in a while, so I just thought I'd ask. Oh, and tell Leslie I said hi because I just had her at my library last month for Christmas on State Street. So hi. she's a remarkable woman. You did a good job picking her because she she's a she's a great woman. <laughs> well, I tend to agree too. Uh, yeah, elderdice.net, a l e r d i c e dot net is the website that I contributed to. I do a field genealogy of the Barclay Allardyces. I also have it on Ancestry.com. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Robert Barclay Allardyce was a power walker, a long-distance walker, and probably the champion long-distance walker of his age uh, in the early 1800s and that. And his descendant is now a post retired postmaster in uh, Leominster, Massachusetts. And arguably, he's the heir to the Earl, Earldom of Erith, but uh, that was litigated in the House of uh, Lords, and the claim failed. But if you want to know more about the Barclay Allardyces and the Barons of Allardyce, um, just go Ancestry.com, Allardyce, uh, well, the one, the, the family tree that I put there. Perfect hey, note. Hey. Perfect note to conclude on Professor Allardyce. And we, we just can't thank you enough, Bruce, for this very interesting and enlightening presentation. And really, I, I want to thank all of you for being here every single month. I hope you'll all be with us next month to, uh, to hear David O. Stewart. And in the meanwhile, I will bid you a safe, blessed New Year start. So see you next month. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, everyone. Happy Thank New you. Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you.